All right, so uh, no, I am not shaved, and it's night, which is why it's dark. I'll try something a little bit different. I'm going to try to do a research review on video, and this is probably going to be an absolute disaster. Although the paper I want to look at, I will look at very briefly, and it's kind of lead into a follow up on something else. So the title of the paper I want to look at is called Protein Synthesis Rates of Muscle, Tendon, Ligament, Cartilage, and Bone Tissue in Vivo in Humans. Uh, I've included the reference in the uh, description and on my website. Um, I would just mention the final author on the paper is uh, Luke Van Loon, who's been doing protein research forever. Um, so this, this is a big protein lab. So their goal, well, let me back up. A lot of studies have looked at rates of protein synthesis in the skeletal muscle, either at rest, in response to training, in response to diet, right? We've got a lot of research on this, and I'll come back to that. This paper set out to determine those rates of protein synthesis in all those other tissues, right? Tendon, ligament, cartilage, bone. Uh, I think they looked at a couple of others, synovium and fat pad and things of that nature. Or we don't have a lot of data, but it's important. You'll see why it's important because I want to lead this into. So they had a relatively small sample size, six healthy male and female subjects that were scheduled to undergo knee arthroplasty, uh, knee surgery, right? So basically, this they do this a lot, right? They, they will have folks come in for a hospital uh, procedure, and pretty much, since they're going to be cutting them in, into them anyway, they go ahead and, and do some study. So... And um, so in that vein, well, when I was at UCLA, I uh, actually interned in a research lab because uh, high lane, high bread, I actually have done science uh, and don't feel a need to use ad hominems like that to dismiss real criticism like you guys. Anyway, I was working with um, two researchers, uh, Brian Whip and Dr. Ward. I'm sorry, I forget her, her name. And they were studying uh, carotid body resected patients. And the carotid body is a thing in your body that uh, senses oxygen levels. And at the time, right, this was like 92, it was thought that this was the primary system that was able to like increase oxygen uptake during exercise. Well, UCLA happens to do the carotid body resected surgery and has a large population of these patients. So Dr. Whip and Dr. Ward, who were exercise physiologists, uh, wanted to study this group to see could they increase their oxygen uptake during graded exercise. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, I was involved in like lab setup. I was uh, involved in part of like during the, the studies uh, themselves as far as data taking. And I worked with some of the data analysis. The point being that frequently in these odd situations, when you had this specific subject group to study, you take advantage of it. That's what this particular knee study was doing. They had six knee surgery patients. Why not cut into them and do some science? And that's what they did. It is a small sample size. It needs to be replicated. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge that. So um, I'm not going to get into the methods too much because it's really technical and it's really complicated and it involves using the infusion of radioactively labeled phenylalanine, which is amino acid, uh, doing a whole bunch of calculations, blood flow. I don't begin to understand it. I'm going to presume that they did it properly just because I said Van Loon has been around forever. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I don't have the background to, to assess that. So I'm going to take it at face value that it was correct. Um, and during this, they took blood and tissue samples for muscle, tendon, ligament, bone, cartilage, menisci, fat, and synovium. Uh, and they used that to measure protein synthesis rates in all those tissues. Um, and the short version of a long description, and I'll read you their quotes, is that all of these tissues had the same basal protein synthetic rate. There was no significant differences. As they state, using stable isotope methodology, we showed that average basal protein synthesis rates of various musculoskeletal tissues were within the same range of skeletal muscle protein synthesis rates with fractional muscle, tendon, bone, cartilage, ligament, menisci, fat, and synovium protein synthesis rates ranging between 0.02 and 0.13% per hour in vivo in humans. Uh, which is a long way of saying that all of these tissues had identical protein synthetic rates. Uh, first, here's the image showing what and where the specific tissues measured were, along with their protein synthesis rates.
Since that's a little difficult to see since the numbers are tiny, here's an image showing the actual rates of protein synthesis on a bar graph. While they do look visually different, they didn't reach statistical significance. And in current science, that's the method that we use. Finally, here's the chart showing the differences in protein synthetic rates numerically. Um, again, note that all the values are very small, right? People forget that the basal rate of protein synthesis is actually very, very small. Uh, but again, they were all statistically identical. They did not reach the P less than 0 0.05 level. So what this suggests is that many other protein-containing tissues, including connective tissue, have the same basal synthesis rate as skeletal muscle, which means they have a protein requirement. They then, in the discussion, mention skeletal muscle protein synthesis rates observed in the present study averaged 0.04 plus, plus or minus 0.01% per hour. These rates are similar to muscle protein synthesis rates assessed previously in an overnight fasted state in a wide variety of subjects studied in our lab as well as in many other laboratories. And some of those other labs include protein researchers like Wolf and Stu Phillips. And I'm mentioning him, or again, what I'm going to lead into. With protein synthesis rates ranging between 1 to 2% per 24 hours, skeletal muscle tissue shows extensive remodeling within a matter of weeks to months, right? And that's kind of the, the thrust of this, right? We know that protein break, synthesis and breakdown rates allow muscle to be very plastic. Go lift weights, do it properly, muscle gets bigger. Mitochondrial proteins with endurance training can increase because of these, these rates over a fairly rapid amount of time. Now the question we don't have the answer to for most of these tissues is how rapidly they change. We do have for bone, bone is very slow, right? It may take a year to, to change bone mineral density three to 5%, right? It's very, very, very slow. They do mention specifically, it has been previously observed that gelatin supplementation can stimulate collagen synthesis following exercise. I mentioned that in my Nutrition for Injury Recovery book. Oh, I can't remember his name right now. Basically gave Jell-O before they did uh, jumping rope and it doubled uh, protein synthesis in, in the tendons. Um, and collagen hydrosylate supplementation has been reported to increase collagen content in the knee of osteoarthritis patients, right? Huge push on collagen protein because it provides the glycine that is important for collagen synthesis. Not only skin, hair, and nails, right? Uh, hair and hooves, as I like to call them. Um, but also, you know, general connective tissue health, important for, for athletes. They add, and may decrease knee pain in athletes with activity-related joint pain. From a clinical perspective, this is more than interesting, because identifying which specific proteins or protein fractions are responsive to external stimuli may enable us to develop more effective therapies in treating or preventing injuries. So the basic goal of their paper was to see what are the protein synthetic rates of all these non-muscle tissues that had not yet been measured, especially not within the same study. They found that it's all about the same, or about, sorry, it's all about equivalent to muscle protein synthesis. We know that muscle can adapt very quickly in response to training and loading. We know that it generally ligaments and tendon, uh, these tissues do tend to be a little bit slower blood flow, or that's always been what's assumed, but maybe not, right? We now need more data on how loading changes that protein synthesis. The researchers uh, conclude their discussion. Uh, in conclusion, basal, fractional, muscle, tendon, bone, cartilage, ligament, and menisci protein synthesis rates range between 0.02 and 0.13% per hour in vivo in humans. Fractional tissue protein synthesis rates of tendon, bone, cartilage, ligament, and menisci do not differ substantially from muscle tissue protein synthesis rates, suggesting that these musculoskeletal tissues may express a greater level of tissue plasticity than generally believed. And that's really the key, is presumably if these tissues are synthesizing and breaking down protein, they have the ability to adapt to training given sufficient stimuli and amino acids to support that protein synthesis. So what's the point of all of this? So earlier this year, I think it was this year, I wrote an article, uh, I believe it's called Protein Requirements for Hypertrophy where I addressed sort of a current um, 
trend in the industry in terms of protein recommendations. And, and I've written several previous articles about this. I wrote my protein book in 2008, um, where I looked at all this data. And uh, the currently, what's being repeated is that uh, the maximal or optimal protein intake per meal is uh, like 0.25 grams per pound, or is it 0.4? It doesn't matter. It's this absolute value, as that has been shown to, and I quote, maximize skeletal muscle protein synthesis. And this results in a value of about 1.6 grams per kg, which is a little bit under 0.8 grams per pound, uh, as an optimal protein intake to once again, and I quote, maximize muscle protein synthesis. The article that I wrote uh, most recently, I laid out a number of reasons why I think that's dumb and wrong. And I won't run through all of them, um, but the, the big one, or, or probably the big issue I made was I, I took, I take issue with the idea of using skeletal muscle protein synthesis as a singular endpoint. And I base that for, on a number of things. One is that skeletal muscle makes up about, on average, 45% of the body's total lean body mass. It's a little bit lower in women, a little bit higher in trained athletes. 40, 50% is usually, 45% is an average. That means that 55% of your total lean body mass is not muscle. And a large proportion of that is tissue that requires protein. Organs, liver is in constant turnover, amino acid-based hormones, and connective tissues. And the point, well, the point of my article was that focusing on that one singular endpoint is missing the big picture. Because A, it's less than half of your total lean body mass, which means, and it's certainly not 100% of all the protein using tissues in the body. It ignores protein breakdown, separate issue, I'm not going to get into that. The reason I want to discuss this paper is that it's obvious that these other connective tissues, and technically muscles connective tissue, if you want to get really pedantic about it, not only have a protein synthesis rate, but that it's the same as skeletal muscle, at least at rest, with limited data that it will increase with training, right? The gelatin study, and I've forgotten what his name is. I talked about him in my injury book. Uh, gave basically jello, had him jump rope, and they saw a doubling of protein synthesis rates that the gelatin supported. Apparently it's been shown for other tissues. Bone mineral density is very slow to turn over. The point of it being that it's clear these tissues require protein. It's clear that they adapt to training. It may very well be that their tissue plasticity is much higher than we've previously thought. It may not. <clears throat> There's other stuff than just proteins. There's blood flow rates and things of that nature. The point of this paper was that their protein synthesis rates at rest are the same as skeletal muscle. And again, we know that that can change with, with loading. We know that over the long term, these tissues adapt. They have to. So, so far as I'm concerned, this paper just adds to my argument that this super myopic idea of using skeletal muscle protein synthesis rates as an endpoint to determine daily protein requirements for athletes is missing the big picture. And I made the exact same point in 2008 based on the Norm Vigor reviews I cited, I forget, uh, I don't remember who it was by, maybe Tipton, pointing out that yes, while this amount of protein may maximize, sure, eating more protein than that is not going to increase your muscle growth, but it may be critical to support the other tissues that are adapting long-term to training. I said I wrote about that in 2008, written about it since then, I wrote about it earlier this year. And if you want to really know why I'm doing this, to say, hi, Jorn. Yes, I'm very well aware of, of the article you wrote in, in Alan's research review. And I don't care. Um, you can keep repeating the same arguments. You can assert that Wolf's 
method methodology is wrong, which I say, take it up with him. You can assert that you've got the best technology in your lab to mess with protein synthesis, and I don't care, and here's why. You can have the best telescope in the world. If you're looking at the wrong place in the sky, you draw the wrong conclusion. If all you're looking at is muscle protein synthesis, you miss the big picture, and you're clearly missing the big picture. And the reason I mentioned Stu Phillips earlier in this video is because you work in his lab. His lab is part of the data on muscle protein synthesis. Well, maybe y'all should use that fancy technology and look at some other tissues, because they have a protein requirement too. And if you are truly incapable of understanding that, I can't explain it any more simply. Skeletal muscle is not the only protein-using tissue in the body. It is not the only tissue that adopts, adapts in response to training. Set protein requirements to that one endpoint and ignore the rest of the lean body mass, to ignore the rest of the protein-containing tissues, to ignore the rest of the connective tissues that clearly have an amino acid requirement. It just shows a level of ignorance I can't understand. This isn't even complicated. I'll reiterate what I said in that first piece. I am not making some esoteric argument, in the least. I am simply pointing out there are more tissues in the body that require protein than just skeletal muscle. Said statement being impossible to disagree with unless you truly don't understand a word or a single iota about the body's protein synthesis. And, scale, and lean body mass and how it works. Maybe you should read my book. Maybe you should stop being a butthurt little child because I ripped you into it in my Facebook group. It's not my fault you can't understand why a study with three independent variables is shitty methodology. You can get defensive about it. What's funny is I didn't even mention in my article. Didn't change the fact that you took it personally. That's all on you. Now I am mentioning you, because you're still wrong. And this paper shows why you're wrong. Skeletal muscle protein synthesis is not all that matters in the body. And if you can't understand that, you're in the wrong job. And that's my first video research review. Uh, which is a long way of saying that all of these tissues had identical protein synthetic rates. Uh, First, here's the image showing what and where the specific tissues measured were, along with their protein synthesis rates. Since that's a little difficult to see, since the numbers are tiny, here's an image showing the actual rates of protein synthesis on a bar graph. While they do look visually different, they didn't reach statistical significance. And in current science, that's the method that we use. Finally, here's the chart showing the differences in protein synthetic rates numerically. Um, again, note that all the values are very small, right? People forget that the basal rate of protein synthesis is actually very, very small. Uh, but again, they were all statistically identical. They did not reach the P less than 0 0.05 level. So what this suggests is that many of the protein-containing tissues, including connective tissue, have the same basal synthesis rate as skeletal muscle which means they have a protein requirement.